Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Wellness Wednesdays webinar. I'm Krista Ellis, Community Engagement Manager for the Parkinson's Foundation. Helping me behind the scenes are my colleagues, Jenny Fearday, Laura Cameron, Danielle Agpillow, and Grace Bassler. The Parkinson's Foundation is a nonprofit focused on bettering the lives of people living with Parkinson's through improving care and advancing research. Importantly, everything we do is in close concert with our community to ensure that our actions are aligned with the needs and priorities of those living with and affected with Parkinson's disease. Today, we understand mind and memory in Parkinson's disease. Thinking changes, mental confusion, and altered behaviors can often occur in Parkinson's. These changes can be frustrating and challenging and often have a significant impact on quality of life for the person with Parkinson's and those close to them. What they focus on mid to late stage Parkinson's, we will understand what causes these changes, ways to manage them, and how to communicate concerns with family members and the care team. We are recording today's presentation. You will receive a follow-up email with a link to today's recording and other resources in coming days. The Parkinson's Foundation provides weekly education and wellness programs virtually through our PD Health at Home series, including Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, Fitness Fridays, Expert Briefings, and our Spanish language programming, EP Salud en Casa. Join us for our next Wellness Wednesday on October 4th for a Parkinson's 101. This program will provide a basic overview of Parkinson's disease and is open to everyone. Invite your family members, colleagues, peers, anyone you wish to learn more about what is impacting your life currently. Learn more and register for our PD Health at Home events at parkinson.org slash PD Health and one of my colleagues will share that link with you. I would like to invite you to join us this Friday for our live Fitness Friday session. Synapse is a dynamic high energy workout that stimulates your body and mind to move and think stronger. The goal of this class is to get you moving stronger in every way necessary to help you live stronger every day. Seated and standing options will be presented. You can sign up to attend this movement class live streaming at parkinson.org slash pdhealth. We'd like to take this moment to thank Acadia for their generous support of the Parkinson's Foundation's mission. Thank you, Acadia. To begin our formal presentation, we would like to introduce today's expert presenter. Dr. Solman is a board-certified neuropsychologist who has advanced training in movement disorders from the University of Florida and the Barrow Mer Neurological Institute slash Muhammad Ali Parkinson Center. She currently practices at Prisma Health, University of South Carolina at Richland Medical Center. Dr. Solman is passionate about teaching patients and care partners the whys and the hows of managing movement and age-associated disorders that affect cognition, emotions, behavior, and personality. Dr. Solman, thank you for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Appreciate you being here. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. And there we go. So thank you so much for the introduction and the warm welcome. I'm going to be talking about mind and memory, as Miss Ellis mentioned. And I have no disclosures, no financial conflicts of interest. Want everyone to know that I hope everyone gains something from this talk, not just our persons with Parkinson's disease, but also care partners and, and people who love someone with Parkinson's disease. The knowledge you'll gain today can translate also into your life. So I hope you find it beneficial. Um, we're going to hold questions till the end. Feel free to write them in the chat box or um, submit them other ways. And um, so just as a little bit of overview, uh, Ms. Ellis already went through this already, but we're going to talk about thinking changes, focusing especially on executive functions and dementia and other changes um, to behavior that happen in the mid to late stages of Parkinson's disease. I want to teach you about how to respond to these as a person with Parkinson's or as someone who is interacting with someone who has Parkinson's disease, learn some different strategies for that, um, and also to emphasize how important it is to be aware of your team, the people that are there to help you, and to reach out to them, okay? So no talk on 
dementia of any type was is um in, is complete without an overview on what normal aging is and what the brain experiences. So our brain is a really complex organism. We've got a structure to it. It's made of physical tissue. We've got a chemical communication system and chemical environment. Most of you already have heard of dopamine, which is the chemical that is depleted in Parkinson's disease, sometimes years before you start to see your first physical symptoms. And we've got electrical systems as well. And all of these systems interact with each other, both in a healthy brain and in a brain that has been um, affected by injury or by disease. Damage to any of these um, systems is a lot like dominoes. It has a downstream effect. And so when you have um, chemicals like dopamine being depleted, it affects other areas of brain functioning and structure. So that is one point that's really important. But the other thing that we need to know is that our brain, you know, it starts at point zero when we're born. And over our lifespan, our brain is affected by many different things. And so what happens to us as we get older is a direct factor of, first of all, I like to say the strength of our foundation. So um, what our skills and strengths and compensations are before we start to have disease or injury. Um, the size and seriousness and, and number and closeness and proximity of any sort of neurological insults or illnesses or injuries that have been experienced throughout the lifetime. And many of you may have heard that even those early childhood concussions are playing a big role in later life um, brain health. And um, the most important thing is our ability to identify these changes and symptoms that we're experiencing and to confront them. So um, I am so much of an advocate for taking control of our health and identifying problems because there are always things that we can do. So I want you to feel empowered after this talk. What are those brain health bandits, the things that affect us throughout our life? It's really important to know these because um, the more aggressively you can tackle these, the slower your Parkinson's disease can progress. Um, and so some of the things that you're probably hearing about in the news are nutrition. We're finding that people who have iron deficiency and B vitamin deficiencies can have memory loss that is sometimes not reversible protein is important too. Um, calories, these things fuel our brain. They give us energy and um, there are medications that hinder absorption of these like proton pump inhibitors. So we're hearing more about the importance of not taking things like Prilosec if we don't need it. Hydration, I know you hear, hear about that a lot. It's not just to give us energy and it really does give you energy. Um, but it's also for cleansing out the brain. We're finding um, that the brain has something sort of like tidal waves and it comes through and cleans out the tissue using that hydration. Our kidneys use it to, to cleanse out toxins as well that affect cognition. Oxygen, of course, is really important. And sleep apnea is the biggest threat to our brain getting good oxygen. Um, Air pollution is being shown to be affecting our cognition and our brain health. And then chemicals, of course, tobacco, we all know is bad for us. We're finding that there's no safe amount of alcohol, even red wine, unfortunately. There are contaminants in our food. You know, we have all these threats around us to our brain health. Um, and one of the most important ones that even some physicians don't know about are medications that are called anticholinergics. These are things like Benadryl um, and other antihistamines and many sleep aids, whether they're over the counter or prescription. These rob the brain of a chemical that's really important for cognition. And especially if we take them at nighttime before sleep, they can prevent us from having that chemical there that is needed for memory formation. Okay. Some of the other brain health bandits, as I like to call them, thinking about the house analogy again, if you've got bad plumbing, so your arteries, vessels are clogged by plaque from high cholesterol, that slows down the ability for the brain to receive nutritious, oxygen-rich blood. 
that it needs for powering itself and for communication. If our blood pressure is off, it can be either too low in Parkinson's disease or it can be too high from other medical factors. Again, that affects the flow of oxygen and nutrients. Chronic stress creates a toxic environment for our brain. I know you've all heard that before. Um, so this is your PSA to take good care of yourself and to try to minimize stress through outlets like exercise and getting together with friends. Um, but the hormone that's produced by that is harmful to the memory system we now know and inactivity. So a lot of us sit around at our desks or in front of the television, especially as it gets harder to move and be up and about. Um, and we're finding that as people become less active, their brain also atrophies or shrinks. There was a great um, program I watched recently about a group of um, Italians in their hundreds that climb hills every day on the way to church and they're doing so well um, physically and mentally and so you know we cannot understate the importance of exercise. And another brain health bandit that we're learning a lot more about these days is the immune system and sometimes it becomes overactive and attacks parts of our body like in rheumatoid arthritis and some other forms of arthritis. Um, and so it's really important to make sure you have good physicians on your team to help tackle all of these things. So what does all of this mean for Parkinson's disease? Well, regardless of where you are in the journey, whether you're at the start of the disease or you've um, been tackling it for a long time, addressing these bandits is going to help not only your physical health and your quality of life, but it should slow the progression of both the Parkinson's disease and the cognitive decline associated with it. And these recommendations apply to everybody, whether you have Parkinson's or not. We're finding that people who do these things are less likely to develop other forms of dementia or decline. Um, and the really cool thing about this is that people find that when they tackle one of these brain health bandits, a lot of other things fall into place. So tackling diabetes, you find your weight goes down, sleep apnea improves, you don't need that pesky CPAP anymore. Okay. And exercise is one of my favorite ways to knock out several of these at once. So taking that information, let's translate it to the Parkinsonian brain. And I want to start by just head on addressing that term dementia. What is that word? People use it differently, even in the health professions. Um, in general, dementia means that someone has experienced changes to thinking skills and cognition that are above and beyond where they should be for their age, and that this is a stable condition, meaning it's not something that we can reverse by treating depression or by treating um, another medical condition, okay? In Parkinson's disease, these changes can involve a lot of different areas, which I'm gonna go over in more depth, but um, it's really important to know that dementia does not have to involve memory. There are dementias where we do not see memory change until much, much late in the process. So what are the domains or the areas of thinking skills that someone in my profession will look at or think about? One is processing speed, how quickly we understand or respond. Another is our visual reasoning skills. These are things like knowing how to navigate from one place to another, remember, remembering where in the house the scissors are stored, being able to see something that's directly in front of you, being able to recognize people and buildings, okay? We've got language skills, both understanding or receptive language skills and expressing yourself in words and sentences. We've got executive functions, which are those higher level skills that the CEO of a com company usually uses like planning and organization, okay? I'm gonna talk about those a lot more later. We've got learning and memory, which I'm gonna take a deep dive into for you as well. And emotional and behavioral reg regulation, okay? Um, the changes that a person is experiencing in any type of dementia syndrome have to be so significant that they cause difficulty with performing activities of daily living. 
ADLs as they're called. And that's a buzzword that refers to the things that a person needs to do to sustain safe and effective life, not just eating and bathing and grooming, um, but also getting to your doctor's appointments, making sure your bills are paid on time, um, keeping your house environment safe and clean, free of clutter, all those sorts of things that are important to daily life, okay? So it gets a little sticky because some people will compensate well for these. They'll put safeguards in place, like setting up auto draft to compensate for memory deficits. And it gets a little tricky to decide if we're gonna assign a diagnosis of dementia, but there are some other terms that physicians and neuropsychologists will use also to say, we've got a problem. There's some difficulties with thinking skills, but we're not concerned right now about your safety at home. Um, it's really important to consider that different people have different skills at their baseline, at their foundation. And so, you know, there are Einsteins who start way up here with their skills. And there are people that had learning differences from the get-go. And so they're starting in a different place. And um, when I do an assessment to look at someone's thinking skills, I, I have to consider that. How far has the person fallen? It's an important concept. So if you think of the brain like a gas tank that has reserve, some people have a lot more reserve to help them go further. Um, and other people can't take as big of a hit. And so, you know, this is something that I have to think about, um, but that's also important for you to communicate when you talk with your doctors, okay? There are many kinds of dementia. Dementia is just the umbrella term. Parkinson's disease has a dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most prevalent dementia. Um, there's vascular dementia, which means that a person's changes are due solely to cerebrovascular insults. Um, and I could go on. There are probably a hundred different types of dementia. You can have a gene to cause a type of dementia and never develop the dementia. Okay. That's really important to know. You can have evidence of a dementia's physical pathology in the brain and not appear symptomatic. That's also really important to know for those of you who want to go to your doctors and say, test me, do the imaging, do the genetic studies. What's more important is what we see when you sit down with your neuropsychologist and we take a deep dive looking at these skills and talking with your family, okay? It's how it translates into everyday life that matters. Unfortunately, the older we grow, the less likely we are to have one illness or one contributor to dementia. And this is where things can become really complicated. And so today I'm going to talk about, you know, many general symptoms of Parkinsonian dementia and cognitive decline. But keep in mind, this won't describe everyone because many of us older adults will have um, even small degrees of Alzheimer's type pathology or, or other things going on that clouds the picture. Um, so if you feel like you have some unusual symptoms, you may want to um, speak with a neuropsychologist directly about those and ask about them, okay? Um, because they'll have some good tips and tricks for how to manage those symptoms. Research, again, is showing the power of addressing the modifiable bandits of brain health and slowing the onset and progression of many of these dementia types. And so I want you to feel empowered no matter how old you are, where you are in your Parkinsonian journey to dive right in and tackle this because it will make a difference. Okay. So let's talk about neuropsychological decline specifically in Parkinson's disease. What are those changes? Um, so I'm gonna talk about cognitive or thinking skills changes as well as neurobehavioral changes. Neurobehavioral changes are those related to emotions, behavior, personality, interpersonal functioning, okay? And these can vary slightly from person to person. No two individuals with Parkinson's disease will look the same, so to speak. But in general, we see some themes such that um, individuals with tremor predominant Parkinson's disease show some symptoms and a certain rate of unfolding and individuals with more of an akinetic rigid subtype show other types. I'll talk about what those are in a minute. 
Um, also, what causes our Parkinson's disease can dictate that. So if you have a young onset variant, um, you can have a rapid progression or you can have an incredibly slow progression. Um, then there are variants like frontotemporal dementia with Parkinson's disease, and, and those have their own subset of symptoms. So again, you may not fit the bill to a T, but write down your questions and your concerns and bring them to your neuropsychologist, okay? Where we are in the medication on-off cycle plays a big role in the symptoms that we see. That's really important to know for planning and for working around difficulties. And sometimes the specific medications themselves that you're taking can also play a big role, okay? We'll talk about that a little bit more. In Parkinson's disease, the most common symptoms may be obvious to some of you, but I'm going to go over them. So first of all, our rate or speed of doing things just slows down, okay? It takes more resources for the brain to do those things because that dopamine is such an important fuel for brain energy and brain speed. And again, the dopamine depletion is affecting um, the brain's structure at a neurobiological level, okay? So we're slower to process, we're slower to think, and we're slower to execute our responses. Visual spatial skills are actually the second most prevalent changes. And these are experienced by everyone, but they're typically not noticed. Um, they happen very, very slowly over the course of the disease. And it's not that the visual reasoning area of the brain is affected by Parkinson's disease, but rather our brain is working hard to keep atop the skills it needs for us to function optimally day to day. And we live in a language dominant world. So it's going to prioritize talking, communication skills, using auditory skills. The visual ones aren't as important. We're also not exposed to a lot of new things that we see on a daily basis. Our homes look the same, our community looks the same. So it's not being exercised, okay? Some of the visual spatial changes are understanding the gestalt. I'm sure you've heard trees for the forest. You're not seeing the big picture or you're too stuck in a small component of the picture. So it might give you difficulty lining up your plants when you're sowing a garden. You may have difficulty with judgment of size, speed, or depth, which can make parking more challenging. It can make roadway navigation more challenging, knowing, knowing when you can safely pull out in front of another vehicle. Um, may give you some more difficulty with facial recognition. Um, I've had roofers who say, I used to be able to estimate the amount of material I'd need within 10 square feet, and now I can't even get within 100 square feet, okay? Um, individuals who live in very visual dominant worlds, such as engineers and contractors, tend to hold on to these skills better, again, because um, our brain works to prioritize what it needs for our daily functioning, okay? Another incredibly common symptom or cognitive change that you'll see in Parkinson's is difficulty with retrieval, reaching into your brain and pulling out information like names of your medications, names of family members that you haven't seen in a long time, names of your doctors, trivia, that sort of thing. That becomes really, really hard. And it's often called a memory difficulty, but I want to differentiate. It's not the same as an Alzheimer's type memory challenge where information is no longer there. Cues help when we have retrieval difficulty. And then the executive function skills changes. So again, think of the CEO of a corporation. What do they need to do? Well, they have to hold something in mind briefly while the brain is juggling with it. They need to think ahead and plan and sequence and anticipate which involves a lot of brainstorming as well. You'd be surprised at how much of our day involves brainstorming or coming up with ideas and potential options and solutions. You need to remember to remember. So a great example of remembering to remember or prospective memory is after this webinar, I need to go to the grocery store and buy milk, right? Um, so that can be really challenging being flexible becomes harder. Again, it's tied to that brainstorming. That's why I've highlighted that. It's such a universal symptom and skill that's so important to us. 
initiating becomes very challenging. And that's also a huge part of everyday life. Think about all the things that you initiate from morning to sundown, deciding to brush your teeth and whether or not to shower or to put on makeup or to do your stretches or to exercise. There's so many things that we need to use initiation for, okay? Um, these executive skills can translate into relationships. So having the bandwidth to anticipate what others are experiencing and what their needs are, what their reactions might be to things, okay? And then memory is also something that's affected and it's highly tied to executive functions in Parkinson's disease. This is due to that retrieval difficulty as well as when we're um, generating memories, we're creating that drop down menu of options to help test ourselves and select viable answers. And so that becomes harder. So I'm gonna take a deep dive into learning and memory. This is a really complicated subject and it's something that we spend a lot of time assessing in a neuropsychological testing session. So learning is different from memory. To remember requires learning, but it also requires us to retain or to hold on to that information beyond just a few minutes or beyond 20 minutes. Some people will start to have degradation or loss of memories a few days after or a week after they've experienced. Pay attention to when that's happening. That's important for your doctors to know. Now, to learn requires a lot of things. And this is something that can vary from day to day. We need to be awake and well-fed and in the present mind to be open to learning. Then we need to be able to detect either the sound or the sight that's coming in and shift our attention to it. So in a conversation, being able to look at a person, read their lips if you have hearing trouble and pay attention to what they're saying. That attention is such a huge component and attention is really strongly related to all of those bodily things that we experience like fatigue, medication off cycle, being thirsty, being tired, not having slept well, being anxious, being depressed, um, having something that's more important on our minds, okay? We need to be able to sustain our attention and everyone's ability to hold their attention can vary. Some people can do it for hours. Other people have a few minutes and you've got to be aware of where that person is. Okay. You need to understand and that can change as I mentioned when our processing speed is slowing down. And again, you need to be able to process things quickly that involves relating what you're hearing to something else. So in a normal conversation, we don't just focus on the words that a person's saying, but those words generate mental images of past experiences, of things that are going on right now, of other bits of information that relate to it. And we're aware of some of these, but usually we're not aware. It's happening at a millisecond based level. And our brain is using all of this experience to help learn what we're experiencing. And that helps us to hold on to it. It rehearses that pattern of firing at a neurobiological level in our sleep and throughout the day, okay? And so that rehearsal is, is also important. And again, you're seeing huge overlap. These executive functions are so heavily intertwined in that learning process. So, you know, what we need to do is we need to make sure that all things are in order for a person to be learning and remembering. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment, okay? I don't think that we mention enough um, how clear the relationship is between progression of physical symptoms in Parkinson's and progression of cognitive changes in Parkinson's. These are directly related. And um, so what we'll see is it, it really depends on, on your own personal Parkinson's journey, but typically about 10 years in, people start to have a lot more difficulty with their physical functioning. And, and that's when family members may pick up on some subtle cognitive changes, okay? 
I told you I was going to come back to PD subtypes and, and what they experience in terms of cognition. And this is really important to be aware of in terms of when you're going to have family discussions or conversations about business affairs, things like that. But people who are off or who have an akinetic rigid subtype of Parkinson's tend to have a lot more difficulty with slowing of their processing speed, slowed communication, um, slowed thinking, Information will leak out because of that time that it's taking. So think of a colander where stuff is just seeping through. And um, so things drop out before you can process it, before you can come back to it. You can't hold things on mind long enough, right? Depression really makes that worse. And we also see a lot more of this when people have apathy, which I'm going to talk about later. Individuals with dyskinesias because of their medications. Their mind also tends to be more frenetic or scattered. They have more difficulty with attention and being present, whether or not they're aware of their dyskinesias, okay? And so that's important for your loved ones to be aware of. Um, where we are with our physical health, with our self-care, with our coping mechanism and exercise also dictates the symptoms that we experience in our cognition in Parkinson's disease. Why is that? Well, I think it has to do with those chemicals. So we already know dopamine is an energizing chemical. It's a fuel for us. Um, there are other chemicals and hormones that are present from exercise and from doing breathing and meditative exercises, um, from taking time to relax. And these things help fuel the brain. I think this is one of the reasons that medications like SSRIs such as Zoloft or Lexapro help while they tend to target a, a chemical called serotonin neurotransmitter instead of dopamine specifically, it does help um, many, many areas of Parkinsonian functioning and cognitive functioning for um, individuals. So what are the things that we need to do to help individuals who are experiencing some of these changes in thinking skills? Obviously, we want to hone our physical health and tackle those brain bandits. You want to make sure that when you're having important conversations that all systems are a go. You've got the person when they're in their medication best on time. They're feeling emotionally well. They're not distracted by something else that's on their mind or hungry or becoming off in their medication. Okay. You want to make sure you've got direct time face-to-face -face for conversations. Don't say things in passing, no matter how busy you are. Um, I really like the strategy of sitting down like you are a family business, okay? We get out of the habit of doing the things that the CEO does when we retire, but you really need to. No matter whether you have a neurological condition or not, this is so important for your efficacy to enjoy your retirement. So pick a day of the week that you sit down as a family unit or as friends or just by yourself and brainstorm, have a, a daily planner. I love seven day planners that are visual, use color coding, um, have a monthly calendar, dry erase board, use your electronic reminders, all those sorts of things to help keep you on track. There are so many great electronic resources like Alexa um, or Google Home, and I would love to do another webinar on that alone because they're so helpful for the executive functions and for the Parkinsonian memory changes, okay? And exercise, so profoundly important. Those endorphins get us um, feeling sharper. We sleep better, and then that has a downstream effect on cognition and rate of progression. And See a speech and language pathologist, SLP. They focus on cognition. They can teach you strategies. Or if you have a neuropsychologist locally, ask to see them to talk about your specific concerns or weaknesses in thinking skills. We can give you lots of personalized strategies, um, either you as a person with Parkinson's or you and your loved ones as a family unit. I personally prefer to meet with people as a group so that we can um, form a system that's going to work best in your home environment. Okay. So that was cognitive changes. And I, and I mentioned that the cognitive and the neurobehavioral changes overlap very, very heavily. Um, the neurobehavioral symptoms can vary throughout the Parkinsonian journey. So obviously when you're first diagnosed, you may have a reactive depression and be thinking about how this is gonna rob you and affect your life. Um, 
you may experience grief for the things that you anticipate you may be losing. As Parkinson's affects some of your physical abilities, or as you retire or go through other life changes, whether or not they're related to Parkinson's, that affects your sense of identity or your role in life. And that can cause depression and grief and a sense of being lost or empty, which is really important to be aware of. Anxiety is something that is more internalized by the average person with Parkinson's. Um, but I do tend to see it a lot more when people are often stuck, they feel trapped um, or in social and public settings, worrying about other people looking at you or judging you, okay? And this is something that's so important to tackle um, because it really prevents us from being a part of a community and we're social beings, we need each other. Um, we uplift each other. And that movement and activity in the community is so helpful to giving us um, variety in our life, okay? Impulse control problems, such as gambling, sex addictions, ice cream addiction is more common. Um, they are directly tied to some of the medications um, that, that doctors may try, especially early in the course of Parkinson's. A person who's experiencing these impulse control changes, unfortunately, is not usually aware of them or does not view them as a problem, which can be harmful to them as well as to a family unit or a household unit. And so this is something where a loved one needs to feel empowered to let the medical team know that there's something going wrong with the medication. And, and it can be embarrassing, yes, but you're doing your loved one a service by saying, I think that this medication is overstimulating my loved one. They're, they're doing things that are out of character for them, okay? Because unfortunately I've had patients get into a lot of legal difficulty because of this impulse control difficulty or financial difficulty, okay? Irritability is a very common symptom and irritability is nonspecific, meaning it can be a symptom of depression, it can be a symptom of anxiety, it can be a symptom of just not feeling well, having low energy or stress in relationships. It's important to call it what it is and say, I don't know what's causing it, but I'm gonna turn this over to our doctors so that they can work on identifying it. Um, men tend to be more irritable when they're depressed than women. When women tend to um, experience depression more in terms of um, sadness and tearfulness, okay? But there's no one size fits all, fits all with that. And no talk is complete without addressing apathy. In my opinion, apathy is sort of the um, hallmark emotional or neurobehavioral symptom of Parkinson's disease. And it's something that everyone is going to experience to some extent. It typically starts early in the course of the disease and um, it grows to affect more and more of your daily functioning. So what is apathy? Apathy can be emotional or it can be behavioral. With emotional apathy, the extremes of emotions are constricted. So you don't get as excited as you used to. You don't get as upset as you used to about things. You're more blunted or flat, okay? Um, you may have fewer preferences or opinions. Politics may not get under your skin like it used to. Um, all those sorts of things. Behavioral apathy involves initiative that get up and go, interest in learning new things and trying new things. Everything feels like a mountain when you have apathy. And it's important for those of us who are not experiencing it to recognize that this is not intentional on the part of someone with Parkinson's disease. It's not an oversight on their end. It's just that everything requires a massive amount of energy, okay? We have to differentiate apathy from depression. It's often confused for depression because a person isn't peppy. They aren't active. Um, the best way to do that is to say, are you having negative thoughts? Are the negative thoughts about yourself or your future or the world or your relationships, are they a prevalent theme? Are you having sadness specifically? And don't confuse that with pseudo-bulbar affect where a person may laugh or cry more easily like when they're watching Hallmark. That's not necessarily sadness, but rather 
um, just expressing it outwardly. Okay. Um, keep in mind that apathy is going to be worse when your energy is low and when your PD is suboptimally treated with medication. So you certainly want to make sure that you have a movement disorders neurology expert that you can go to and make sure that they're aggressively managing your Parkinson's disease, helping you to feel your best. Okay. You can have both depression and apathy, but Unfortunately, in advanced Parkinson's disease, apathy predominates. And this is something that is important to start tackling early in the course of the disease. Forming habits, okay, using a schedule and a routine. When things are on a schedule book, our brain doesn't go through that process of deciding if we're going to do something or not. Same thing with when it's part of our routine, like brushing our teeth. And so for some reason, we don't experience that inward sensation of feeling like we're climbing up a mountain when you're doing something that's on a schedule or part of a habit or routine. Okay. So that is so incredibly important. Um, again, unretire yourself and be the CEO. I like to tell people to schedule four hours a day, five days a week, just like you're working, where you're engaging in things that are scheduled, such as the exercise, um, having a board meeting with your household unit, um, reviewing the day ahead and the day behind and planning the week ahead, brainstorming together things that you're going to do. It's really, really helpful and important. Um, keep a list of potential activities to choose from. Get creative. You've got to brainstorm these together. Okay. Um, this can include chores. I didn't write that on the slide, um, but also all the other stuff that is a part of our everyday life that I've listed there, social, physical, artistic, things in nature, leisure, music, movie, history, animals. You know, there are lots of different topics that we can brainstorm ideas for. Okay. And um, know your resources. So um, if you are uncertain how you should be spending your time or what you should be doing, you can use YouTube, you can go to the YMCA, um, local parks, and connect with others through things like FaceTime or um, Facebook Messenger, okay? With apathy, it's incredibly important that you have a, a partner who helps direct behavior, such as organization and working on the honeydew list and taking medication and getting the taxes together, all that sort of stuff. Um, a spouse or a partner can start to feel like a nag, um, and that's not a good place for the relationship to be, okay? So it can be helpful to hire an assistant to work with your loved one who has Parkinson's disease um, or use other strategies, okay? Apathy is incredibly hard on relationships. Um, the weight that one person pulls in terms of managing a household tends to slowly increase. It's easier to just do it yourself than to wait on someone to follow through with something that you've asked them to do several times, right? It's easier to do it yourself than to experience the frustration of having things not get done when you've asked them to be done. Um, and it's a slippery slope. You start picking up those extra balls and before you know it, you are juggling a million balls at once and you're leading yourself to burnout, in which case nobody wins, okay? The other thing that happens with apathy is that those of you who are in a partnership, whether it's a parent-child relationship or a spouse or partner relationship, that relationship is gonna change because of apathy because the person may not necessarily think to ask you about your day at work or to initiate conversations about um, a movie that you saw or politics like they used to in the past. And so you've gotta be creative to think of ways to connect, whether you initiate those conversations um, or you spend more time reminiscing on things that can be easier for um, a Parkinsonian brain to talk about the past. Um, and as a care partner or someone who loves someone with Parkinson's disease, it's important to sit down and specifically um, identify what you are missing from that relationship and then seek it out through your siblings, your clergy, your um, community, a therapist, through immersing yourself in books, okay? Um, that's what's going to help keep you going strong and feeling positive. I want to talk a little bit more about depression and anxiety. Um, 
exercise and activity and especially cardiovascular activity are so critically important for these. They burn off catecholamines, which are important for creating that sense of anxiety. They're gonna help us to sleep better, which is gonna reduce depression and anxiety. Schedule things to look forward to once a week, once a month, and yearly. Have those immediate, short-term, and long-range goals. I see my patients who do that feeling so much better. They come in brighter when they've got something like a trip coming up. And when that happens, their cognition is brighter. They're more present. They're more attentive. They're remembering better. Avoid the magnetic chair. So fill your time with activities, use a schedule. Again, brainstorm together. Um, spend time in the sun and nature, that perks us up as well. Um, and if you are stuck at home um, or you don't have transportation or you just don't love to get out as much, think about making your home environment a positive place by putting on um, rotating screensavers of nature scenes, having a bird feeder at your back window, those sorts of things, okay? And especially work on identifying your new role and your new hobbies or activities. So maybe the family dynamic shifts and a person with Parkinson's disease becomes the CEO of household. So taking care of the dishes and writing out the grocery list and all those sorts of things. Um, but it's important to have that role and sense of identity and, and um, purpose. Leaving any sort of mental health symptom undiagnosed and untreated is really toxic to our brain. We become less physically active. We decline more quickly in our Parkinson's. Um, there is a clear association between slowing Parkinson's progression through exercise. So it's really important to do that. And um, that will slow our cognitive decline as well. There's also mounting research on human and rodent models in dementia syndromes um, on things like SSRIs, such as Lexapro and Zoloft, being associated with better cognition because we have neuroproliferation branch formation and also um, less um, Alzheimer's pathology in the brain. So don't be afraid to ask for those medications. But it, if, if it is pure apathy without depression, that can be worse with an SSRI. So you need a proper diagnosis. We just have a few minutes left here, and so I want to quickly talk about um, hallucinations. And these can be elicited by medication, especially early in the trial of a new medication, and they're much more common in advanced Parkinson's. Typically, they start in our periphery thinking we're seeing something in our side, and then gradually it moves more central to our vision, and we're seeing well-formed things such as animals or people that may be familiar to us. The brain does this logically, I think, to keep us alert because it's trying to fill in the gaps of missing information as the brain has not been prioritizing keeping those visual skills strong. Um, it's not important to treat this unless it's uh, disturbing to a person with Parkinson's or it's causing physical safety issues, okay? Um, and these symptoms unfortunately can become stronger and more frequent um, as a person is developing Lewy body disease, which is on the spectrum of Parkinson's disease unfolding over time. So we can reduce the incidence and prevalence of hallucinations by keeping the room brightly lit, reminding yourself that your brain is going to play tricks on you. It's trying to fill in the gaps. Take your time to think through, is this logical? Is there really a deer in my bedroom, right? What, what is the probability of that? Keeping clutter out of our way, which can be misperceived. When traveling to new areas, take time to get there early in the day, have the lights bright, familiarize yourself with your environment, okay? The more novel your environment is, the more likely you're to be confused by it. Teach reality checks early on. Um, obviously our pets are gonna growl if there is an intruder or if there's another animal there. Ask your family, trust them when they say, no, we don't have mice right now, okay? Communicate proactively um, with someone who's experiencing hallucinations. Um, I gave you some examples. You look fearful. Are you experiencing a hallucination? Let me help you through this, okay? I'm here with you. We're safe. 
Um, having good sleep wake is really important. Um, hydrating earlier in the day so you're not awoken in the middle of the night for that restroom break can be helpful. And then talking to doctors about medications. Okay. Delusions are fixed thoughts or beliefs without a basis in reality, and these become prevalent um, in later Parkinson's disease. Most commonly, these are things such as believing that your spouse is cheating on you or your children are robbing you or people are plotting to put you in a home. Um, and, and these are really painful for people. They really believe them. And um, many delusions can also result from hallucinations. So if people are hearing things, they might think that there's someone that's moved into their attic, for example. There's something called the cap bra delusion where you look like my spouse, you sound like my spouse, but you are a duplicate you're the other spouse, right? And this can be extremely distressing for a care partner, but be aware that that can happen and it's important for the neurologist to know when that's happening. Similar one to that is called reduplicative paramnesia. This looks like my house, but it's not my house, okay? And then these can be really challenging. These symptoms are best managed with medication, and it's really important that you keep your neuropsychologist, neuro, neurologist on board. Um, in the interim, learn to center someone. Remain calm in your voice. People pick up on your body posture and your language. Um, and of course, validate. You don't want to argue with a person, but validate what they're experiencing so that they feel like you're on their team. That's really helpful, okay? protecting your loved ones from stressors without making them feel like they're being excluded can also help reduce the prevalence of these. So they tend to kick up when there are stresses in life, like a move coming up or, you know, something's going on in the children's lives. Mid to late disease, there can be profound or intermittent confusion, another um, cue that Lewy body disease is going on, but sometimes this is caused by infections um, or by blood pressure variability. And so it's really important to talk to your doctors about these symptoms. Um, something as simple as an undiagnosed urinary tract infection or COVID can cause these profound alterations in thinking skills that tend to be very temporary. Don't wait to decide if you need to talk to the doctor about it. Call them up, send them an in-basket in the medical record, ask your doctors, okay? Um, they'll be able to help you differentiate delirium and dementia. When it's a part of Lewy body disease, it just happens more regularly, and it can happen any time of day. And it can also include fluctuation of arousal where there are days a person's their usual self, and they don't seem like they even have any sort of dementia. And then there are days that are really somnolent, and things just aren't making any sense or adding up, okay? Um, certain medications have to be avoided when we reach Lewy body disease. So it's really important that you get this on the record, okay? It's also important to know that because visual spatial functions are usually pretty impaired when a person has Lewy body disease. So it makes them unsafe on the road, driving or ambulating or riding bicycles in the community, okay? All of the self-care strategies are gonna help us. I've talked about all of these already um, with the exception of emphasizing the importance of avoiding marijuana and alcohol. Um, and keep, keep, um, keep in mind who your team is, who your healthcare providers are, your speech and language pathologist, your PCP can write an order for that, your neuropsychologist, your neurologist, your physical therapist, your occupational therapist, your clergy, yoga instructors, all of these people are important to your well-being, okay? Um, I'm gonna end there in the interest of having enough time for some questions and answers. Um, Krista, are you able to take over the screen here? Yes, thank you. For thank that. you. Um, we have so many really thoughtful and sincere questions. So I'm um, gonna start with Roger and Elena. They shared, you know, asking, how can I communicate to my loved one that I'm noticing cognition issues? How do we communicate this? That's a really tricky subject, but such a great question. I'm glad you asked it. Number one, we don't want to hit a person over the head with the fact that they're experiencing decline. It causes depression. It causes demoralization. Instead, focus on what a person can do. 
okay? Um, that, that's always my recommendation. Um, if there are significant concerns about decision making, then it's best to address that in a supportive environment. Take the pressure off yourself, but maybe go speak with a licensed marriage and family therapist or someone who's experienced in PD and, and let them lead that discussion on maybe why financial decisions need to be um, handled more prominently by someone different, okay? I don't, I don't think it's wise to hit us over the head, but focus on what we can do when you take something away, replace it with another thing, okay? Thank you, Dr. Salman. We got a few questions around medications for memory or confusions. Are there medicines that help with memory? And if so, are they specific to Parkinson's or are they for dementia? So I'm not a medication prescriber. As a caveat, um, what I can tell you is that yes, there are medications that are helpful, whether a person has Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Um, your neurologist is the person who's gonna be best to address that. But number one, I personally think that we need to start with an SSRI to tackle any component of anxiety, irritability, and depression, because I do see improvement in cognition and alertness and energy with that. That's a great starting point. But then the medications for dementia, like um, rivastigmine or Exelon, um, research and experience is showing that these help tremendously with Parkinson's and Lewy body related dementia, that they can reduce the prevalence of hallucinations. They can make a person cognitively brighter. And again, exercise is a medication. It's not a pill, though it can feel like one, but don't forget that exercise is a medication that you need to make time for as well. Do decongestants affect cognitive decline? That's a great question. I can't answer that one. It's out of my wheelhouse, unfortunately. Thanks for your transparency. So a question from Bob. We know uh, this is a sensitive subject and it's about the, the privilege of driving um, and reminding our community that it is a privilege to drive. What about driving when cognitive deficits have been observed. What, what can you speak to that? Yeah, so driving involves so many skills. It's not just the know-how that you've been doing since you were 14 or 15, but it is anticipating what bad drivers are going to do, anticipating things that are not in your roadway, keeping track of the vehicles in 360 degrees from your own vehicle, there's so many facets to driving. Um, and the safest thing to do is to start with a neuropsych evaluation. And then if the neuropsychologist has questions and, and you debate their findings, you can do a formal on the road driving evaluation, but you definitely want to protect yourself legally because once you have a neurological diagnosis on the books, if you get pulled over, your medical records get subpoenaed in an accident, it could be really bad for your financial estate. People look to take advantage. Um, even if you're not at fault for an accident, I had a patient who was rear-ended and when the police showed up with the lights. That person was so distraught that they couldn't communicate what happened. And someone else tried to point the finger at them and say they caused the accident. Look, they're impaired. They can't even communicate their thought. And it's really sad, but it happens. And so you need to be thinking about protecting yourself and your estate as well as protecting the community. Okay. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, our final question, and this is from one of our Facebook viewers, is a lack of empathy related to Parkinson's. So they're experiencing that their loved one with Parkinson's doesn't have any accountability for their actions. Is yeah. Really yeah. So that relates to the executive functions and to the apathy. So things don't affect us emotionally as much, and we have a hard time juggling all of the bits of information. So anticipating what's going on in someone else's life and how it might be affecting them. Reading body language and facial expression cues for how a person is feeling. 
all of those skills will decline. And it's not personal. It's not that the person loves you less. It's just that their brain does not allow them to process this. And so you need to be more direct with them. You need to sit down and just say, do you mind if I share with you what's going on in my heart? I had a really bad day. And I bet you'll find that that person will want to hear. They may not have advice for you, um, or, you know, other things that involve brainstorming. But I think that that step is important in a relationship to continue to try to have that conversation. Thank you, Dr. Solman. As we close our formal presentation, just want to ask if you have two, maybe three things that you could offer our community that they could take home today to help cope with these changes in the mind and memory of living with Parkinson's. So number one, I want you to feel empowered. You have way more control over how your body and your brain does in the months and years to come than you ever realized before, okay? So how do we control this? Number one, we commit. We commit to living our best lives. Keep that carrot dangling in front of you. What do you want your life to look like? Always have your eye on the horizon. What are the things that you wanna look forward to? And then use that to motivate you to take the steps, much like you would have at another point in life. For example, if you were taking a, a course or a class or training for an athletic program, start small, work your way up, schedule it in, okay? So those things are exercise and focusing on nutrition, getting good sleep. So taking care of this body, this temple is gonna help your mind and it's gonna help your quality of life and it's gonna help your future. I think that's more than three things, but. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Solman, for your time and your presence today and for sharing your knowledge with our community in this virtual space. And thanks to all of you who joined us today from across the world, from across the country of the United States and beyond. A follow-up email will be sent with a survey. Please tell us what you think and what you thought about today's program. There's also an open response where you can suggest future topics that we can explore in this virtual space together. You will receive a link to today's presentation along with additional resources to support your navigation through mind and memory changes of Parkinson's disease. Thanking today's sponsor again for their generous support. We appreciate you, Acadia, for offering um, support in the foundation's mission. So thank you for, for providing us with that support. If you had a question today that was not answered, please reach out to our helpline by calling 1-800-4PD-INFO or emailing helpline at parkinson.org. You can use that same contact info to order our free resources, educational book series, and our hospital safety kit. We thank you for joining us today and we'll see you again soon. Be well.